the Plymouth Colony Saga, told by the women who lived it, by the Central Texas Mayflower Colony of the Texas Society of Mayflower Descendants. Videos in the series Plymouth Colony Saga include the wives of colony leaders, Alice Carpenter Southworth Bradford, the wife of Edward Southworth and Governor William Bradford, and Susanna Jackson White Winslow, the wife of William White and Edward Winslow, which is in two parts. Wives of prominent couples include Elizabeth Tilly Howland, wife of John Howland, and Priscilla Mullen Alden, the wife of John Alden. Introducing Alice Carpenter Southworth Bradford, presented by Betty Prince. Descended of Pilgrim William Bradford, Pilgrim Richard Warren, Pilgrim Francis Cook, and Pilgrim John Cook. Good morning. My name is Alice Carpenter Southworth Bradford, and I am a resident of Plymouth Colony. The year is now 1670 AD, and at 87 years of age, I have just finished drafting my last will and testament. I am the widow of Mr. William Bradford, who was governor of Plymouth Colony for much of the 30 year period following the colony's founding. My dear husband died in 1657. I am now old, but continue with my task of administering our estate for the benefit of our children, William and Joseph Bradford, and my sons from my previous marriage to Edward Southworth, Constant and Thomas. I spend much of my time increasing the value of our estate by trading in pieces of land and caring for our large flock of animals for the benefit of our children. It is said that our estate is now one of the larger in the colony, for which I am thankful to the grace of God. My story begins with the gift of the attention of two attractive young men when I was a young woman, Edward Southworth and William Bradford. I loved both of them dearly, and both seemed intent on marriage. We were all religious separatist English, exiled in Holland. The Kingdom of England at the time was in turmoil. Many of us who believed in separating the Church of England from un unbiblical practices had been forced to flee from England to Amsterdam in 1607 to avoid imprisonment. My family encouraged the attentions of Edward Southworth, since his family line went back through the royalty of England and France. I decided to yield to the wisdom of my family, and Edward and I were married in 1613 in Holland. By 1616, we had two beautiful sons, Constant and Thomas. In Amsterdam, Edward became a respected leader of the separatists and I supported his efforts by the grace of God and with the best of my abilities. My old friend William Bradford in 1616 at age 23 married Dorothy May, another separatist who was then 16 years of age. They had a son John in 1617, three years before the Mayflower sailed. The separatists in Holland had formed a plan to travel to the New World and establish a colony there, which would be free from the religious pressures of England and permit their children to grow up with their English language and heritage. Some of the men planned to travel on ahead and prepare the settlement for the arrival of their families. Others took their families with them. Those going prepared to travel on two ships, the Mayflower, and a smaller flagship, the Speedwell. Edward was to sail on the Speedwell, but fell ill before the journey began, and then died, leaving me a widow in Holland with two young children. The other colonists, after abandoning the Speedwell, which proved unseaworthy, crowded into the Mayflower. They departed on September 16, 1620, and docked on December 18, at what would become Plymouth Colony after three harrowing months at sea. Many of them fell ill from overcrowding and disease, 
and died after reaching port in the middle of a very cold winter. Among those who died was William Bradford's wife, Dorothy May, who accidentally fell from the deck of the Mayflower and drowned before ever setting foot in the new colony. Governor Carver, the first governor of Plymouth Colony, also died that first spring. The colonists then elected my dear William to be governor of the colony. After a time of grieving, William wrote to me asking if I would travel to the colony and marry him. His responsibilities were very heavy, and while he professed deep love for me, he also needed a companion to help support him in his work. I agreed, and leaving my young sons with family in 1623, I boarded the Anne, a ship on the way to the new colony. The journey took three months. Five wives of colonists already in Plymouth, along with their children and with other colonists' children, were also on the ship. And I listened closely to their stories gathered from letters from their husbands, and so Saint gained some knowledge of what lay ahead of me. All of us, by the grace of God, had avoided the terrible first winter in Plymouth and were intent on helping our husbands form lasting households in the new world. William and I were married shortly after my arrival. The colony's native allies, the Wampanoag, led by Massasoit, brought over a hundred natives for a huge celebration at the wedding ceremony. Many arrived carrying meat and fowl for a feast which the pilgrim women prepared. The natives shot off rounds of arrows and the colonists responded with musket rounds. The noise was deafening. The celebration continued for several days. I watched and listened and gained an early knowledge of our native allies. This celebration was documented by one of the men to his brother back in England and became widely publicized there. I had brought with me the household goods needed to set up a suitable home for the governor of Plymouth to be hosting visitors. I set about ordering our household to serve his requirements. We were married for 30 years during most of which time William was repeatedly re-elected to serve as governor of Plymouth. My dear William, although not university educated, was foremost a scholar and drew strength from reading in his extensive library of books in English, Dutch, Greek, and Hebrew. From them he found wisdom and guidance for governing the colony. I listened to many discussions on the tasks involved in governing. These tasks included putting the colony on a sound financial footing by paying off the debts to the investors in England who had sponsored the Mayflower's voyage. Much of the debt was paid by establishing a fur trading post and by logging operations. He also spent many hours and much thought on maintaining good relationships with the natives who sold the colonists the beaver pelts and the salmon and cooperated in setting up outposts for logging timbers that were exported to England. He was involved in the court system that developed to govern the colony. He also experimented with social structures, initial, initially with people holding everything in common, but found it worked better when each family owned land and worked their own land. He kept extensive records of the colonists and their activities, much of which he compiled into a book in his later years. He spent many hours in meetings with the people, governing to the best of his ability and by the grace of God. I made sure he was suitably dressed for all occasions and that our home could serve as a meeting place for those who visited our colony from outside and for the many visitors we had from within the colony. I stocked an adequate kitchen with good pots and dishes to eat meals together in our living room. In time, we had three sturdy children, William, Joseph, and Mercy, in addition to my dear Constant and Thomas, who had joined us in Plymouth. Our adventure in the new world was busy and dedicated to the glory of God. Alice Carpenter Southworth Bradford, reenactor, Betty Prince. Technical production, Ann Bell. Background music, Betty Prince. <laughs>